Well, you've now met Lloyd over here. You've now seen how he works. You also understand uh, what the, the background that he comes from and also the type of material that he's going to be using in this series on Sharia. And it's important that that uh, you are aware of that. I, the, with the last video that we put up caused understandably quite a quite a bit of uh, of uh, response from people, uh, which is not surprising. We're talking about a difficult subject, the amputation of hands. Most people don't even know that that's happening or that takes place. You saw some of the pictures we put up. Those are recent pictures that are happening in uh, the Middle East. Uh, they are from Syria and Iraq and also from Saudi Arabia. So it is a punishment that is quite popular in some circles, but most people would react and say, yes, but this is an uh, aversion. This is an aberration. This is not true Islam, nor is this true fiqh or true sharia. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to, I've asked uh, our good friend Lloyd to come back and to expand upon it, to explain it, and also to show you we're not just talking about one verse. We're not even just talking about 44 pages in the Hidayah manual. We're actually talking about something that is endemic to Islam. This is one of those injunctions. And remember, if it's an injunction that you first read about in the Quran itself, the Quran is eternal according to Islam. Therefore, if it's eternal, this is an injunction that comes from God himself. This is not something that we can make up or change or manipulate or try to delete or, or uh, create. We can't, we don't have that power as humans to do that. So we need to take it very seriously. Uh, you have brought the, and you talk about this, Lloyd. I'm going to give it to you and I want you to help us unpack. Why is this practice of amputation? Why is it so important to Islam? What is its authority? And if it is authoritative, then should we expect people to actually be carrying it out, out in every Islamic country, in every Islamic environment? Over to you. Good question. The Sharia is the final distillation of all of the words of Allah and all of the commands of Muhammad. Now, Allah and Muhammad are both considered within the Sharia, the lawgiver. In fact, they are synonymous. They're effectively the same person. Muhammad speaks with the same authority as Allah. So they are effectively indistinguishable in the Sharia, unless anyone wants to step forward and call Muhammad a liar or say that Muhammad has no authority, that they do not follow him and reject him. Now, because there is so much abrogation, for instance, the Quran is abrogated. We know that many verses of the Quran, and in fact, this is covered within the Sharia itself in detail, where they discuss the fact of abrogation of various verses. They also discuss that the Quran abrogates certain hadith, but also hadith abrogate the Quran. Certain verses in the Quran abrogate other verses, but also certain hadith abrogate previous hadith. This creates a huge amount of confusion. There are hundreds of scholars, hundreds of tafsirs. This creates, again, a mishmash of confusion. Who do you believe? So that all had to be sorted out. All of that had to be clarified. And the final consensus, the final opinion, the ijma, is what is now finally in the Sharia. So this is the final set of opinions, the authoritative set of opinions. However, there's additional confusion which must be alleviated here as well because there's a range of opinion. So there are four schools of fiqh and they have a range of opinion. This difference between the four schools does not make them four separate religions in conflict. This would go against the tenets of Islam, again, covered in the Sharia, but I'll pass on that for now. This difference has a name. It's the doctrine called ikhtilaf, literally difference. And this range falls into what's called azima and ruhsa, strictness and dispensation. Azima, strictness, ruhsa, dispensation. A Muslim that prays strictly five times a day, this is azima. He is being strict. He is following everything. Ruhsa is when a Muslim maybe doesn't pray five times a day. However, he is still following the correct doctrine, even though he's technically violating azima. So Muslims can do two opposite and contradictory things and yet still receive reward from Allah because they are following doctrine. Because this difference is considered a mercy from Allah because not everyone is equally capable, not everyone is equally competent, not everyone has equal ability. So there are lots of interesting things within Islam which have to be made clear as we go. Now, the ijma is the final alleviation of all of the confusion within Islam so that there's no personal interpretation. 
so that you have a fixed set of ideas, beliefs, and precepts to work from a set of general precepts, which everyone knows, everyone can follow, so that there is no confusion. We mentioned the number of the dozens, we mentioned the dozens of pages of law derived from the Quran, and we'll see also derived from one or two hadith that make up the laws on amputation in Islam. There are, there are over 40 pages of these laws. And there's one verse in the Quran that you cited. Now, let's have a look at that and actually see how this is then expressed, how the, the verse and the hadith are then taken together. And this exegesis then ends up in a set of general laws that tell Muslims exactly what to do, when to do it, how to do it. Because otherwise, if you have every Muslim making up his own interpretation, you have, you have a riot on your hands. You don't have any consensus. You don't have any logic to follow if everyone makes up his own mind as to what the Quran means. So let's have a look at that. You can see the screen, Jay? Yeah, so this is the Hidayah. And just so people know, this is the jurisdiction for the uh, the Hanafi school. The Hanafi school are known as the, probably the most popular school today. About a third of all Sunni Muslims would follow this school. And so it's, that's why it's important because it's it, it is probably the most well the most popular of all of the manuals for the different four schools the hanafi school and you're going to look at it now that what i understand there are a number of volumes how many volumes this is volume two that you're that we're looking at at, at this point are there four volumes or are there more than that there are four volumes there's roughly 2650 plus pages Okay, okay. And so this is the one that you referred to in our last video, which has 44 pages, just on more than 44. I just covered that section, which just talks about the amputation but okay. from right. the section on theft. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it should be noted that these different schools, while this is the Hadaya manual for Hanafi Islam, for instance, the expert for another subject for argument's sake, let's take a tame topic like marriage, maybe the expert on marriage in Islam is in the Hanbali school. So then all of these experts will have their own opinions, but if they need a final opinion, they will go to that expert in that school in his book. So they will cross reference to each other constantly. Oh, so I no see. one school, okay. no one manual covers every topic. So they will cross reference to others. Therefore, there's a constant sharing between these schools. Okay. It, it, would the equivalent that we have in Christianity be our denominations? You have different denominations in Christianity that share the same beliefs but they, the practice and the way they're worked out and the way they are practiced would be different depending on the Presbyterian or the Lutheran or the Calvinists or the Anglican. Would this, uh, would they're one religion, correct. They're okay. one religion. They're not meant to be four separate religions because there's a number of stipulations around this that I'll throw these out there. We will cover these in detail later. However, the Islamic Imams cannot be wrong. They're infallible. Their rulings are absolute. The hand of Allah is over the group and therefore they cannot make a mistake and they cannot ever and have never agreed on an error. This is considered dogma within the Islamic law. Well, then so, if, therefore, if that's the case, why is it we do find contradiction between these four different schools? They're not contradictions, they're differences. This is called ikhtilaf. The major scholar that deals with the topic of ikhtilaf is Shar'ani. We mentioned him in the previous episode. And of course, this is simply considered a mercy from Allah, a range of possible behaviors that Allah allows between azimah, strictness, and ruhsa. So when you say extremist and moderate, those are not categories that exist. There's strict following of the law, and there is the moderate application, which is the, the relaxation of the law to those who cannot adopt strictness, who aren't able to achieve that. So ruhsa and azima, strictness and dispensation. Hanbali are known as the most strict. Uh, and for instance, when you talk about the... The most austere, they're the most austere. Okay. They are correct. Now, the differences, the differences between the schools are not on major issues of doctrine. The differences are often cosmetic. When you pray, do you hold your hands up by your face? Do you hold your hands up by your down by your navel? Those little differences do not affect the practice of Islam, nor do they affect fundamental core doctrines. These are merely cosmetic. So the, they agree. So Muslims will happily tell us, oh, but the scholars disagree yeah, on 20% of things that don't matter. They agree on the 80% that do matter. All right. Well, here's, a, here's an example. The Hanbali school stipulate that if somebody apostatized, leaves Islam, that they must be killed within one day, within that same day, 24 hours. Whereas the Hanafi school says, no, you're giving three days to repent. There is a difference in doctrine, but that also would have quite a, 
it would have quite a huge ramification if you're the person who's apostatized and you still have correct. A Both are correct. Both are correct. Remember, this is covered within the doctrine of Echtelaf. Now, look, to cover this, we'd have to go into a separate subject. We'd have to do a separate video, spend an hour talking about just that. This, these things are detailed. Right? No, I, I, so I'm not, they're both I'm correct. Not, you're you're I'm allowed. Fine. That's fine. So there are differences even in doctrine as far as days of how many days you, you leave before you're executed. Things as That's not simple. That has a huge ramification for the person who's going to be killed. Correct. Correct. But they might cross-reference, they might follow a different school. In fact, Muslims are allowed, I wouldn't say to pick and choose, but they can follow one school in one, set, one area of their life, in one area of practice, and another school in a different area. Technically, they are meant, and there are names for all of these things are named, right? Mukallid, Mukallif, all of these things, Taklid, all of these things have names. Every practice in Islam has a legal name with a description which explains exactly what, why, and how. So they are to follow a scholar, they're to pick a scholar and follow a scholar. And that scholar will belong to a particular school, but they are allowed to use some of their own decision-making to decide, well, in this area of my life, in prayer, for instance, I'm going to follow the Hanbali school, but in marriage, I'm going to follow the Hanafis. You are allowed to do things of that nature. But that's not really where I want to go. I want to jump straight into this topic of amputation and show people what Islamic law actually says, go for what it. the rulings are. All right, so we're in the Hedaya, volume two. Um, I have placed links in the comments and also Jay, if you'll please place those in the description. So here we go, Hedaya. This is book eight, volume two, Saraka or larceny. And I have showed this before of thefts, which occasioned amputation. I did misspeak last time. I said 1751. This was translated in 1791. There is a newer version of this book that has been put out, which I believe tries to whitewash some of the things that these, this earlier translation says. So here we've got six chapters and two of them of thefts, which occasioned amputation and the manner of cutting off the limb of a thief and the execution thereof. Right, so let's have a look through this. We're gonna go through a few pages and actually see what the laws tell us. This is Islamic law. If an adult is found understanding, like, sorry, if an adult of sound understanding, of mental soundness, steals out of undoubted custody 10 dirhams of property to the value of 10 dirhams, the law awards amputation of his hand now, some Muslims will say, but when they say amputation, they mean take away his property, take away his possessions. No, it literally means chop off the hand. God having said in the Quran, if a man or woman steal, cut off their hands. Okay, let's continue. Concerning the amount of the value there, various opinions. There are various opinions. According to our doctors, it is 10 dirhams. According to Shafi, it is the fourth of a dinar. In the opinion of Malik, it is three dirhams. The argument of Malik and Shafi is that in the time of the Prophet, amputation was inflicted for the theft of any article of the value of a shield. Now, the lowest value of a shield upon record is three dirhams. Shafi also observes that the value of the dinar in the time of the Prophet was estimated at 12 dirhams, the fourth of which is three dirhams. Let's have a look at how much money that is. Now, so let's go to 1790 at the time this was translated. Let's have a look at dirham. Okay, so there's actually a little appendix in this text which gives us the, the financial value. And that is roughly nine pence, which equates to, in 2017, two pounds and 88 cents, roughly two dollars. So this is three dollars and 63 cents or two euros and 42 cents. So you have, your hand can be amputated for less than three pounds, less than four dollars. The, the price of a cup of coffee then is what you're saying. Anything Correct. more from a cup of coffee today, you'd be amputated. I, they better yes. put this up. They better put this up at Starbucks then, just to warn people. <laughs> yeah. Now, look, you did ask a question about are Muslims supposed to do this? And in Islamic countries, yes, they are required to. However, again, they are allowed. I'm going to make some very blunt statements as we go through this, and I'm happy to cover those in depth at a later time. But I'm going to make certain very blunt statements based on my knowledge of the Islam. Now. Understand that I've mentioned this difference and I've mentioned this azima and ruhsa. So for instance, if you are unable to fulfill azima completely, you're allowed to use dispensation. You're allowed to violate certain rules. You're allowed to bend certain rules or put them in abeyance until in the future you can fully do so. For instance, there are two places we know where Sharia was in full effect. Under ISIS, under the ISIS Caliphate, that was standard Orthodox Sunni Islam. That was not an aberration. That was the full implementation of the Sharia and also under the Taliban in Afghanistan. What they are doing is 100% standard Sunni Islam. 
no aberration, that is azima. What we're seeing in the West, what we're seeing in other countries, it's just ruhsa. So this is the temporary abeyance of full sharia until they can impose the full sharia once they have established the caliphate. So now the slave and the freeman with respect to amputation are upon equal footing. So the limb of a slave therefore is to be struck off in the same manner as that of a free man. And here they mention the dirham is about 2D sterling. This is in 1790. So the value of the dirham is, and they just speak about it here on this page. And of course, I've just mentioned to you where, what those values are. Let's continue here. So punishment is due upon a single confession. Amputation is inflicted upon a single confession, according to Hanifa and Muhammad. The argument of Hanifa and Muhammad is that the theft is rendered apparent by a single confession, which suffices. So if one person says he did this, you can have your hand amputated. Amputation is inflicted upon the testimony of two witnesses. Sorry, single confession, two witnesses. By the testimony of two witnesses, the theft is made apparent and fully established. However, every single Islamic law, because it is a legal system, there are loopholes and exceptions to everything. Understand this. There is not a single precept in Islam which cannot be violated, cannot be broken, bent, put in abeyance, not a single thing. So all of this can change depending on various factors. There are always loopholes. So the thief must be held in confinement on suspicion. There is no, you are innocent until proven guilty. You are guilty until proven innocent. If a party commit theft and each of the party receives 10 dirhams, the hand of each is to be cut off. Aisha, she said, Muhammad's wife, Muhammad's child wife, has said that in the time of the prophet, this punishment was not inflicted for petty thefts. Okay, stealing garden stuffs, stealing fowls, and so on, stealing bamboo. Well, that's, that's good to know. Let's continue here. If a person were to steal wheat, for instance, or sugar, all the doctors agree, the imam, that his hand should be struck off. Shafi mentions the hand is to be struck off for the theft of all the articles aforesaid because of the saying of the prophet. The hand shall not be struck off for the stealing of dates or palm fruits, but where those are kept in a barn, amputation is occurred by the theft of them. In other words, if palms and dates are on trees and you steal them, you're not going to lose your hand. But if those, those fruits are in a barn and you steal them, you will have your hand amputated. The difference is what they call, they're in the custody. The difference is custody. That's a legal technicality. In the bond, they're in custody. Someone has taken them, put them in the bond. They're his. They're in his custody. You're stolen from the custody of someone. When on a tree, they're not in custody. So these are legal distinctions. Amputation is not incurred by stealing fruit whilst upon the tree or grain which has not been reaped because this is not, this is not being considered in custody. The hand of a thief is not struck off for stealing fermented liquor. Now notice, again, exceptions everywhere. There are always exceptions in the Sharia. So the hand of a thief is not taken for stealing fermented liquor, that's alcohol, because he may explain his intention in taking it by saying, I took it with a view to spill it or to destroy the bottle, to throw it away, right? Also, because some fermented liquors are not lawful property, such as wine, therefore wine must be destroyed. In fact, you will see Sharia law, which makes explicit reference to destroying bottles of wine. It is legal. You've seen the video in France, for instance, of a man, Muslim man walking into a liquor store, destroying the bottles. That is legal in the Sharia. It is explicitly stated. The hand is not cut off for stealing guitar or musical instrument. Therefore, the, these being of use merely as idle amusements. Uh, your comment, Jay, before I continue? Yeah, I mean, it seems here what they're doing is they're killing two birds with one stone. They're saying you can steal or destroy anything that is considered to be haram. Haram in Islam means illegal. Yes. Alcohol is illegal. The playing of instruments is illegal. Music is illegal. If you're destroying the instruments, you're destroying the liquor. That is perfectly halal. That's okay to do. Yes. Interestingly, if once when it comes, here's what's on my question is: I've always assumed, that at least here in this America, this is the case. If a tree is on the land that belongs to a person, uh, like a farmer. You cannot take the fruit off that tree because that that tree belongs to that farmer. But what this is saying is, all land doesn't it belongs to everybody. So anybody can pick any fruit they want off of any tree or take any harvest they want off of any field, because it doesn't belong to anybody. It's only once the farmer has done so and stored it, then it becomes illegal. Isn't that interesting? The distinction only then it becomes a major crime. Yeah, the, it's a complete. Remember, Islam is a completely competing. Completely, it's a. Islam is a competing civilization. It competes with... I'll make, an, I'll make an interesting point. Islam is not a moral system. 
In the West, we have what we call morals. We have a moral system. Islam does not follow that convention. It doesn't have a system of right and wrong. It doesn't have right and wrong. It has legal and illegal. And it has legal exceptions, which can make the illegal legal. Yes. Fascinating, though, because it seems to be saying in one case, don't take of this person's fruit because he has picked it already. However, feel free to go into that, go to this person's uh, uh, field and take whatever fruit you want, because there's no such thing as owning of trees or owning of fields. Well, that's what I'm hearing. It's here. still it fall, that would fall in a different category of crime because this would fall, I think, into fraud or <laughs> that that would fall into fraud rather than theft. You're defrauding someone rather than stealing from them. So therefore, you're not, you're not guilty of a crime which causes amputation. That's the difference. So there, there are going to be some well, details. There's a right? law coming at a later time which says do not take fruit from trees because that tree belongs to that person. It just doesn't say do not, in this case, don't amputate the hand. Yeah, that, that, let's, yeah let, let's focus on that. Let's just work on that premise for the moment until we go into more detail at some point. Now, the person who takes a Quran, if you steal a Quran, okay, that person may plead that his intention was to look into it and read it. So there's an out. Every single law, understand, every single law in Islam allows for an out. Every single one. There is no amputation for stealing the door of a mosque. Thank heavens. I'm not sure if that's a common crime in Islamic countries. <laughs> amputation is not incurred by stealing a crucifix, even if it's of gold, nor by stealing a chessboard or chess pieces of gold, as it is as it is in the thief's power to excuse himself by saying, I took them with a the view to break and destroy them as things prohibited. If a crucifix be stolen out of a Christian place of worship, amputation is not incurred. So hence, this already shows us that there is, they are happy to allow leeway for the desecration of Christian places of worship. Amputation all, is not in sorry? all kinds but, of, yeah, I mean, you can just see the ramifications for any any other religion that is in a Muslim context, nothing, everything is open game to them. They can take anything yes. they want from our churches. Or there is no, exactly, this is not a crime. Church. Yeah, it is not a crime. It, it incurs reward for them. It is not considered a crime. And remember, this is the law of Allah. This is greater than the law of man. Therefore, it supersedes everything in Western law. I hope, I hope people are listening. Are you all listening to what Lloyd's saying here? And he's not saying this. He's reading it. You're reading it along with him. So he's not making up as he goes. This is yeah. text. Yeah. So this, obviously, this goes back much further than that, a thousand years prior to that. But this was, yeah, this is an early translation, which was needed because they needed to engage with these people and understand their legal system. Amputation is not incurred by stealing an adult slave. Slavery is completely legal in Islam. As such, an act does not come under the description of theft being usurpation or fraud. Amputation is incurred by stealing an infant slave. Excellent. This infant slave is property. Fantastic. About 30% of the Sharia covers slavery. About 30% of the Sharia is about slavery. And just the last few pages that I will mention. If a person steals any particular article and then he suffer amputation of his hand for the same and after returning the property, again steals that same article, right? His foot, okay? His foot is not to be struck off for such repeated theft. Although, whatever they say, whatever I'm telling you here, they can find a loophole to do exactly the opposite. Understand this. There is always an out. There is always an opposite. Analogy requires that his foot be cut off. You, in fact, you'll find places in the Sharia as we go through where you'll say, where well, the law says, look, you know what? If it's Wednesday, you're not allowed to behead anybody. However, if it's Wednesday and you've just had coffee and the coffee wasn't good and you're in a bad mood, then you can. It'll say, don't kill women and children. But if you do kill them, it's okay because look, they're not, they're not Muslims anyway. Literally, you will find those rulings on the same page, in the same paragraph sometimes. <laughs> so I am not kidding. We, we're going to see these as we go. So analogy requires that his foot be cut off. The prophet has said, if you again steal, let amputation be again inflicted upon him. Now notice it says here, don't do it. Here it says, hey, it's fine. So there's a contradiction there with, right in the same paragraph. Constantly. You will find this constantly because again, Azima and Rosa, the, they have this range to work within. If they don't like you, rule A. If they do like you, well, they can lean it this way. Do you understand? It is not something that you can guarantee one way or another. They have room to work within. They have wiggle room, deliberate wiggle room. It all depends Last on the Correct. Correct. So 
let's have a look at just the last few just to clarify this. So amputation is repeated by cutting off the foot. So they can amputate. Okay, so great. They, they can do repeated amputations. If a person steals anything from the property of his father or mother, his hand is not cut off. Well, that's, that's great to know. Okay, and they have various rulings. If a person commits a theft upon the property of his foster mother, his hand is cut off. Okay, so, well, great. And I believe this may... If a thief breaks through the wall of a house and he enters the house and takes the property and he delivers it to an accomplice standing at the entrance of the hall, amputation is not incurred by either party because the thief who entered the house did not carry out the property and that property before he's coming out fell into the possession of another. These are technicalities which possession is regarded and the other thief has not committed any violation of custody as he did, as he did not enter into the place of custody and hence the full sense of larceny is not applicable. However, this changes if the guy walks outside, hands it to the hold, guy. Hold on yeah. a minute. Let, so I'm getting this correct. You went through that really quickly. So Sorry, yeah. basically what you're saying is if two people go into a house, one stays outside, the other goes in, steals the laptop. Let's say steals my laptop, gives it to the person outside the house. He's standing outside the door and they're both caught. Nothing happens. Yeah, but if the other guy outside sticks his hand into the hole, he just takes the laptop, pulls it out, right. <laughs> then, then he's liable. Then he's liable. <laughs> okay, this, is, this I mean, you can see where jokes can be made about this. You can have whole series of, or you can have entire uh, films done on this and people creating all kinds of uh, gangs. Yeah. They do this all the time, but one person stays outside, the other person gets inside does the stealing, neither of them are, uh, both are caught, but neither of them are found guilty. Yeah, so so there are rules depending if you're inside and the other guy puts his hand through, or you are inside, you put your hand to the outside, or he comes in or you go out, the, the law changes depending on these minor technicalities. For heaven's sake, stay outside. Yeah, got it. Yeah. Now, finally, just the last few notes. These are just the last couple of pages. Yep, yep. Last now couple we're of paragraphs. Grizz, this is the grisly part. This is the, the manner of cutting off the limb of a thief and of the execution of thereof. Want, some of you may not want to go on any further than this because uh, it does get grisly. But we this for those of you who have strong stomachs, go ahead, Lloyd. Help us. How do you actually do it? So the right hand of a thief is to be cut off at the joint of the wrist, and the stump is afterwards cauterized. The amputation is on the authority of the text of the Quran formally quoted and it is to be the right hand on the authority of the reading of Ibn Masdud, who reads the passage alluded to cut off their right hands. Now, what you'll notice is that within the Sharia, within the legal texts, very often they don't necessarily name the particular verse or the Hadith. They'll say in the Hadith that says, because if you don't know, you don't know, but if you're a scholar, you should know. So this is an inside, this is for insiders, right? The amputation is particularly directed to be performed at the wrist because the word yed in the Quran signifies the whole arm up to the shoulder and the wrist joint is included therein that it is certified wherefore in that sense the text is followed blah 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 moreover it is related of the prophet that he ordered the hand of a thief to be struck off at the wrist so they're taking here the sunnah the cautery is to be applied at the stump because of a precept of the prophet cut off the hand of a thief and cauterize the part now very little of the hadith and very little of the quran are actually ever quoted within the sharia very little and i can assure you that what appears within the sharia of the quran and the hadith are what is not abrogated this is what is left over after all of the abrogation so this is with a view to warning and determined but not destruction not death they use the term destruction very often for death if the thief who has thus been deprived of his hand again commits a theft his left foot is to be cut off you cannot cut off both hands because then he cannot feed himself, he cannot function, and therefore he can die. And the aim is not to cause him to die. That's you meant to warn him and deter him and deter others. Okay. And for the second, the left foot may be cut off. It states here. Although I'm not saying it's impossible for them to actually go and cut off the second hand. Now, Shafi'i says, and Shafi'i is, is critically important in the development of the Sharia. Okay. Cut off the one of his limbs, and if you again commit the same, cut off another limb, and if you again commit the same a third time, cut off another limb, and if a fourth time another, and if he commits a fifth time, put him to death. There is also an ordinance of Muhammad, still more particularly according with the tenets of Shafi'i upon this upon this head, which is mentioned by Abu Huraira. Now they're mentioning a hadith. The, and this is the final notes that I will make. 
Let me check. Yeah, this is the final thing I'll mention. The prophet said, whoever commits a theft, his right hand is to be cut off. And if again commit theft, his left foot. And if again, his left hand. And if again, his right foot. So now you're going again against this whole idea that no, you shouldn't cut off both limbs. But if you need to, you can. So they can go to either extreme. This wiggle room is consistent throughout the Sharia. The third theft is an offense in the same degree as the first and is even more atrocious. Whereas for the third offense, the law awards punishment in a superior degree. I'll stop there with this. Oh dear. It reminds me of that uh, Monty Python film. I don't know if you've ever seen it, where they, you have, uh, you have uh, one of the knights coming to a river and there is a black knight who is waiting there. He says, you cannot pass this river. You must stop. So they have a fight, right? And they, he first cuts off the first hand. And so the guy picks up the sword from his left hand and they keep fighting. And then he cuts off the second hand and then he cuts off the, the leg. So he's only bouncing on one leg. He says, why? What's wrong? Yeah. Why aren't you fighting? Why aren't you fighting me? He's going to use his mouth. That's all he has left to defend himself. And he's still yelling, oh, you're afraid of me. You're afraid of me. It sounds like this after a while. The question you would ask is, once you've cut off the two hands, how can you keep thieving? What do you have to thieve with? What do you have to grab anything with to take? So in some ways, it just seems obvious that these are just nothing more than injunctions with them or were they ever t carried out? I don't know of any case where there has not well, more than just one hand never cut off. Do you know of any case where they have cut off a hand, then a foot, then a hand, then a foot? Are you aware of this? Uh, no, I haven't looked that deeply into it. Um, no, I've not looked that deeply into it. But the fact that it exists mean that they, the fact that they're not doing it today doesn't mean they won't do it tomorrow. The fact that they're not that doing it now. It has not happened in the past. Otherwise, why would you need to have this injunction? Of yes. the, I'll give an example. For instance, Think of ISIS, when someone who belonged to ISIS, who lived in their territory as one of their members, if they did not go to prayer, there are reports that they would find baskets of heads, buckets of heads all over, like for instance, in places like Raqqa, people would find these for people who were beheaded for not obeying Islam well enough, for not following the Islamic law well enough. And this is not just because they are barbaric, they are following, these are Sunnis, they are following the Sharia to the letter. For instance, this is in the reliance of the traveler, the most common, the most popular Islamic law manual in the world. In law F 1.4, a Muslim who holds the prayer to be obligatory, but through lack of concern, neglects to perform it until its proper time, has not committed unbelief. So he has not committed kufr by missing a prayer. Rather, he is executed, washed, prayed over, and buried in the Muslim cemetery. Wow. 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 ISIS followed this to the letter. That's the Shafi school says that. This is all the schools say this. They will have ranges, variations on this. The lines of the for instance, is for the Shafi school, though, isn't it? These silos between the schools are more of an illusion than a reality. Remember, they will cross reference to each other. For instance, Shafi might be the. For instance, you're going to have specialists in various fields. Now, certain scholars might be very good at like i said marriage so maybe they didn't have time or would not had an interest or they or a different scholar from a particular school developed very good doctrine that became extremely popular and was really really well regarded so they'll just take his doctrine and use that instead they won't write their own they won't use their own they'll just go straight to his understand so the shafi doctrine is valid this is the ijma the consensus this is what is agreed upon by all the schools by all the major scholars and they can never be wrong okay just uh, the about the last part that you have up on the screen there if he if he is asked to repent however he does not get executed so all you need to do is repent if you're caught what if you do it twice three times you repent each time i assume do they have unlimited forgiveness no they do not because we know for a fact that in isis People had their heads chopped off for this crime all the time. So either they did not repent or they got their head cut off before they were given that. that, that because if you go to the Hanbali school, for instance, you have one day. You said, no, in the Shafi school, you have three days. For instance, if you are guilty of ridda, of blasphemy, sorry, right? Blasphemy and uh, of apostasy. However, you have the option of three days. You could kill him on the spot. You have the option of lying because, again, every single law will have a caveat somewhere will have its legal loophole, will have its exception somewhere. It's always the case. And in fact, 
they might decide, okay, well, we need to execute you by killing, by killing you by chopping off your head. But if you go through the schools, the one will say, well, we drown him. The other one says, we burn him, we strangle him. So all of them agree that you die. The only difference is how long till you die and how you die. Okay. Right. Well, thanks so much, Lloyd. This is a good way to really unpack it so we know what we're talking about. We gave the example of amputation. Uh, we're now actually moving into the example of the cutting off of the heads or striking off of heads. Um, is there any more? Let's let's go ahead and bring this one to a closure. Is there anything more you want to say about this before we, I do a summation here? No, I, hopefully this shows people exactly what the Sharia says. This is directly from the major texts of the four schools. So, and this is barbaric. This is primitive. And this is the Sharia. This is what is derived from the Quran, derived from the Hadith. And this is how it is understood and practiced. And if, if the Sharia gets implemented, this will be the law. Okay. Thank you so much. Go ahead. Okay, Lloyd, uh, this has been good for us to sober up and to realize what we're up against. For people who are saying we're, we're making a mountain out of a molehill, I'm sure that's what people are saying. That's what we're seeing in the, some of the comments uh, from the last video. It's not a matter of what we're doing or what we're saying. Uh, what Lloyd did here was just to put up the Hidayah the Hidayah for the Hanafi school. This is their jurisdiction. This is their jurisprudence. We're not making anything up. And to for us to say this is what happens, we don't have to be believed. But when you see it in print there, as you have seen it now, when you see it in black and white, as you now know, the Hanafi, and that's one of the most lenient schools. It's not nearly as stringent as the Hanbali school, for instance. Uh, and this is its jurisdiction, what it says concerning the thievery. Now, you notice, as Lloyd has reminded us, there are many ways to get out of it. It really comes down to who you know, or if you know the right person, or if you're part of the group, or if you have a good, with, good standing within the group. Uh, for those who are not within the group or do not know anybody, it's pretty much the letter of the law, and the letter of the law is very severe. For those of you who say, well, this is nothing to really impinge upon us or impact upon us, thank God you live in a Christian-dominated country. What I mean by that, you live in countries that have been dominated by Christian precepts, by Christian law. Uh, we in the West are dependent and have had an impact on biblical, biblical teachings, the gospel of Jesus Christ for 2,000 years. For that reason, the, our laws are completely different than what you're hearing here. And did you notice how Lloyd ended? Lloyd ended saying, this is barbaric. It is barbaric. There's no better word for it. It has no place in modern life. It has no place for you or me. It has no place for anybody. It has no place for here or anywhere. It should not be around. It should not be practiced. And I think what took an awful lot of people by surprise, Lloyd, in 2014, when ISIS came to the fore, Remember when ISIS came to the fore, the Raqqa, and we had for the first time news reports and we had videos. And because ISIS put out that the big magazine, that the big magazine, which is was their very glossy magazine that they put out once every week, and they showed pictures of exactly what they were doing, and they were amputating hands and they were crucifying people. Well, that comes from chapter five, verse 33, straight out of the Quran again. And they were cutting off the heads of the unbelievable. That comes from chapter 47, verse 4. All of these practices that ISIS was doing, you can read right there in the Quran. But see, you only get one verse here, another verse there, and another verse elsewhere. Chapter 47, verse 4, just one verse on the cutting off of heads. Chapter 5, verse 33, it's just, well, actually, there's more than one. That is just the, probably the most famous one uh, about uh crucifying people and cutting off their hands and feet from opposite ends, which is somewhat what you're talking about right here in the Hidayah. And then, of course, the one that we've been talking about for the last two days, and that is the amputation of the thief's hand. That's in chapter 5, verse 38. What we didn't know and what most people aren't realizing is that the ISIS were not just following the Quran. They weren't just following these verses. They were going back to how these verses are to be applied. One verse, chapter 5, verse 38, says to cut off the hands of the thief. 44 pages and more from their text, from their manual, as to 
where you do it, why you do it, even how you to do it, and what you do if it's be repeated. As you heard, if it gets repeated, then you go to the foot. And then after that, you go to the other hand. And after that, you go to the next foot. And then finally, you actually kill the person. Well, uh, that's the, the manual that ISIS was following. That was the manual that the Taliban were following. That is the manual that any Orthodox Muslim who believes in the Quran and believes in Sharia law, which all Orthodox Muslims are to believe, will follow. It shocked us. We all saw it as barbaric. I considered it to be barbaric. I knew an awful lot more than most people because I've seen this growing up in India. I knew it. I had it around me. We had some of these laws being practiced. So it's not wasn't new to me. Nothing on the at the level or at the uh, the um, maybe not the level, but nothing al along the lines that we saw with ISIS or even the Taliban before that. But it did not shock me because I knew what the Quran said and I knew also what these laws of fiqh says. Now, that's why we brought this on board. It's important that you are aware of the fact that these are not incidentals. This is not something that writers in the West are making up just to make you a gas or make you dislike Islam. We're not, not what we're about. We're trying to say, this is what Muslims must believe. Go ahead, uh, Lloyd, what would you like to say? Can you understand now why Muslims will never engage with and discuss the Sharia, why they insist on taking everything back to the Quran, why they throw their scholars under the bus at the first mention of Islamic law, why they will want to force us to talk about the Hadith because they are contradictory Hadith, they can go in circles. They are contradictory Quran verses, they can go in circles all day. However, the once you go to the Sharia, it is the ugly truth of Islam in black and white. This is the hard backstop. There, there is, this is it. There is no disagreement, right? This is the final interpretation. So, and Muslims do not want this to be, become public. And this is why it must be made known so that we can know the truth and know the facts. Good. Okay. Well, as you can see, I'm so right. glad I'm a Christian and I'm not a Muslim. Thank God we don't have these kind of laws. Some of you may say, yes, but you have laws like this in Judaism, in Mosaic law. Thank God I don't follow Mosaic law uh, because of Matthew chapter five, where Jesus said very clearly, I have not come to destroy the Mosaic law. I have come to fulfill it. And then he gives six applications of how he actually fulfilled it. That is a whole talk just in and of itself. Thank God I follow Jesus. I do not follow Muhammad. It's so good to know that we do have an alternative. And I'm so glad that I live in a country that does follow the precepts. Doesn't? I'm not saying this is a Christian country. Don't get me wrong. Uh, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is the laws and institutions, the Constitution, are based on biblical precepts, which are not barbaric, nothing like what we're seeing here in the Quran. Thanks so much, Lloyd. We're going to have a lot more of you unpacking these for us. This has been good for you to come and actually give us the reference points so that we can know where is it we get our authority or the Muslims get their authority from. All right. Lloyd Thank over you. here, myself, he's in Poland, I'm in the States. Over and out. Thank you, Jay.